it starts. So, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce Daniel McNuff from Microsoft Research. I've, I've known Daniel several years when I go to MSR uh, to pay visits. Uh, so Daniel leads research and development of affective computing at MSR. He did his PhD in the affective computing group with Ross Picard, uh, and he did his bachelor's and master's degree at Cambridge University. Uh, before coming to MSR, he worked in a company called Affectivo, which you may recognize as risk devices. He was director of research. And when he was there, he built a state-of-the-art facial recognition software and he led analysis of the world's largest database of facial expression idioms. He's received a number of accolades, uh, nominations and awards. I, I need a cheat sheet because there's so many. <laughs> nominations and awards from Popular Science Magazine as one of the top inventions in 2011, South by Southwest Interactive, the Webby Awards, SMR, and the Center for Integrative Medicine and Innovative Technology, his work has been widely covered in the popular media, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, BBC, uh, Forbes, and in 2015 he was named a Wired Innovation Fellow, an ACM Future of Computing Academy member. He's given talks at TED and South by Southwest, and it's really important that I tell you a fun fact about Daniel. Uh, Daniel used to do uh, stand-up comedy, so can you ask him about that? <laughs> Hi, Pressure. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for coming, and I'm excited to share some of the work we've been doing, uh, trying to build machines that are more um, ab able to sense and understand human emotions, and uh, ultimately to adapt uh, to people's uh, human experiences. Uh, I want to make this as interactive as possible, so if you have questions, um, feel free to, to um, raise your hand and, and I'll um, try to answer them as best as I can. I want to show you a range of different projects. Uh, it will be at a fairly high level, um, uh, but if you're interested in, in specific details, I believe there's time after this to kind of go into some of the nitty gritty. Um, but as uh, Gloria mentioned uh, in her kind introduction, I did my PhD at the MIT Media Lab with Ross Picard, who wrote the book on effective computing. Um, and uh, she was inspired a lot by the work of uh, Byron Reeves and, and Clifford Nass, uh, who established kind of this notion, or at least um, popularized this notion, that people treat uh, machines as though they are um, in some way uh, human, in a social manner. Um, and that suggests that it's important for those machines, those devices, uh, to understand the ways that people are behaving towards them. Uh, I'm sure you've experienced your um, computer crashing or going to blue screen, and you've shown an expression on your face. It's probably unavoidable. Um, it's just an innate reaction uh, to the frustration you're experiencing. And uh, ultimately, you, you know consciously that that machine doesn't understand how you feel, uh, but what if it could? What if it could uh, recognize that expression and in some way uh, accommodate that? Uh, the truth is at the moment, um, as this book uh, nicely illustrates, computers don't understand if we're happy or sad. Um, you have to say exactly what you mean if you want a machine to understand what it is you're telling it to do. And even then, sometimes it still doesn't work. So there's a long way to go. Um, the things I want to present are um, really kind of uh, at the start of making machines emotionally intelligent. Um, they are very much at the level of um, a young child, I would say, in terms of uh, ability at this stage, but that's still, um, these rudimentary tools in many cases are still very powerful um, in, in, in uh, the types of applications we want to deploy them. But ultimately, um, you know, science fiction has kind of presented a future where um, devices, uh, robots, intelligence can interact uh, with us in a more emotional manner. I, my, my favorite of these is, is R2-D2 because it has a very simple modality of communication, just light and sound, um, but it's still able to communicate emotion and without that ability, um, it wouldn't be nearly as effective as a companion. 
Um, and I think that really kind of illustrates um, what I think of when I think of emotional machines, like machines that are able to sense and reflect uh, emotional information. I'll start off by talking about some of the sensing work we've been doing. Um, this is just this sort of high level kind of uh, um, snapshot of the types of algorithms that we're trying to build to sense things about the world and about um, the behavior and emotional state of individuals. Um, some of them are you know, clearly directly, um, more directly related to, uh, to emotion, like facial expressions. Um, others give us more context about what's happening. <coughs> like, for instance, um, like face, face recognition and face tracking um, helps give us context about who and what is in the environment. Uh, I'll, I'll speak about a couple of these in particular. Um, the first, first I'll talk about facial, um, uh, facial expressions, facial actions, and then I'll talk about the physiology uh, side of the work we've been doing. Uh, so over the past um, uh, couple of centuries, scientists have start, started to investigate more systematically what the face conveys. Um, uh, before the time of Duchenne and Darwin, um, there was very little science uh, to base the interpretation of emotion from facial behavior. Um, but they, they started doing more, more sort of systematic research. Uh, and then um, the work of Paul Ekman, um, Wallace Friesian, and others in the 1960s really started to accelerate this. And uh, I think one of the biggest contributions is the development of the facial action coding systems. This is a, a way of quantifying the behavior um, uh, on, on someone's face by coding the muscles that are being activated by um, electrical stimulation. And uh, it's measured by human observers, typically coding videos and images. Uh, but more recently, we've been able to develop algorithms that can do this um, in an automated fashion. Uh, they're still not um, at the level of a human, but the fact that this is such a laborious task to go through videos and, and images to code them, um, and that they can, the algorithms can do this at a large scale is really appealing, because even if they're not perfect, we can analyze so much more data than would be possible with a, a manual coder. Uh, and so that's part of what I did during my PhD was to start to collect um, videos and analyze them using these tools. Um, and the, 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 the connectivity of the internet allows us to do this. So uh, we asked people to opt in um, while they were surfing the web uh, to allow access to their webcam and for us to record them for a short period of time while they watch some uh, videos. Uh, you can think of it like a, you know, watching a short YouTube video and having your facial expressions um, kind of captured by the camera. Uh, and then we analyze that data. Um, this is an ex a video actually from the I work at Affectiva um, showing kind of how that's coded um, in terms of facial action units. So you can see on the right here, and then basic emotions on the left. Um, now, I, mu I must say that you know, interpreting emotion from facial expression is, is very hard, if not impossible in a sense, because uh, facial expression is just one modality. But there's clear correlations between certain behaviors and certain um, uh, types of emotions. So smiling is generally associated with positive emotion, not always. People can smile when they're sad, they can smile when they're being polite, but generally speaking, it's more positive. Uh, whereas some other actions, uh, like a, a lip to press or a frown, would be associated more with negative emotion or negative state. Um, so one of the things I was excited to do is now we had this large scale data to start to analyze some of the types of demographic um, trends that have been suggested in, uh, and, and, and found in more controlled settings in uh, psychology research. Uh, and one of those uh, that might be the most, <coughs> potentially most obvious is how culture impa impacts um, people's expressions. Uh, I recently went to watch a, um, a Japanese uh, movie that won the Palm Door, um, uh, and it was noticeable to me how I interpreted the characters as being upset <coughs> because they didn't show facial affect. They weren't expressing negative affect, but just the absence of smiling um, and, some, and, and some of the 
uh, more frequent behaviors that I, I'm used to in the social context that I live in led me to interpret their emotion differently. Um, and it's, uh, what we see from our data is that um, if we look at the base rate, so just taking all of the videos we've collected and looking at the percentage of time people spend smiling, that um, people in countries that have a higher um, individualism index, um, this is also, uh, many of these cultural indices are correlated, so this is also correlated with how much um, historical migration there has been in, in these countries. So the US is, is far in the lead in that regard over the last few hundred years. Whereas countries like China and Japan tend to have, uh, over the past, um, have had less migration and have, uh, according to this individualism index, uh, tend to be lower um, in that regard. So it's a more uh, collectivist culture. Uh, we see um, less smiling behavior. Um, and this is pretty consistent with work that was done previous to ours looking at self-reported measures. So they had people fill out surveys um, and David Matsumoto and his colleagues analyzed what people reported they would do in different situations and found a similar type of relationship. So it suggests that these algorithms that we're using are indeed capturing the behaviors that we think they're capturing and that um, people's real behavior matches some of the types of things they say they would do. Um, so it's a nice validation. Uh, next I'll show a video which is one of my favorite examples of this. It will, it's a funny YouTube video that doesn't have any language, so it's easy for people from different countries to understand it. Um, and you'll see traces of the average smiling for people in different countries uh, while the video plays. of behavior is very similar. So at, this, at similar times, uh, people, were, uh, people were smiling. And, uh, but what you see is the frequency, the percentage of people that were smiling um, is different. And uh, this is just a, a sort of one, th one single example of that trend that we saw on the previous slide, um, that there's just less expression in certain cultures uh, of emotion. So the felt emotion might be the same. People in, in China might find this as funny uh, as people in the US, but there's a social norm um, that ex expression is maybe, um, I wouldn't say less valued, but it's just a lower social norm for expression uh, in certain places than in others. Uh, there's also social norms um, uh, across gender, um, and this is something you might be familiar with. There's, in many cultures, there's a, a social pressure um, for uh, women to smile more than men uh, because it's seen as uh, more attractive, um, and this might not be necessarily a good social norm, but it's something that comes across clearly in data um, from many different data sets that we've analyzed, not just um, the video data set, but if you look at images of celebrities, more, um, more photos on average will, uh, of women will have feature smiles than of men. And uh, for negative emotions, it's a bit more mixed. Um, negative expressions uh, like uh, brow furrow tends to be a bit more common in images of men than of women. Um, perhaps because for men, aggressive or negative behavior is more socially acceptable. Um, again, these norms are not necessarily things that um, are good. Uh, they just are things that potentially exist um, in, 
in, in the cultures that, um, uh, that have grown up. Uh, grown up. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of looking at large scale data. Uh, now I want to show some examples um, of more recent work where we've been looking at longitudinal tracking uh, of this. Um, and it's something I'm particularly excited about because with facial expressions and other types of emotional signals uh, that we might be collecting, it's really important to know the baseline uh, for an individual um, and understand the variation for them because one person could behave you know, very differently uh, from another individual. Uh, so what we've been doing more recently um, is uh, deploying, um, with people's consent, uh, a piece of software that's running on their machine um, to capture uh, information from their video, uh, their, their webcam and their microphone, um, uh, and code their, um, their facial expressions, code uh, some of their, their language um, uh, sentiment, and also their voice prosody, uh, prosodic features. Um, and also capture contextual information about what they were doing on the machine. Um, we had people install this software um, on their machines uh, and, and leave it running uh, for a period of time. Um, between uh, sort of a few days and a few weeks, they could choose if they wanted to uninstall it at any point um, in some cases. In other cases, we, we had them install it for a specific duration of time. Uh, I'll be talking mostly about the data we gather from classification of their facial um, expressions and also from um, classification of their email uh, content, uh, so uh, messages that they're, they're sending. Not the, con not the, not the uh, sort of semantic content of that, but the, more the emotional um, content. Uh, so people would install this, they'd have it running in their offices, um, and then whenever they were in front of their, their computer in their office, it would be collecting this data. Um, if, they, if they left their office, if they went to a meeting, uh, if they left to go home, then we wouldn't have data during that period. Um, so what you'll see is that most of the data we have uh, is uh, while people are in the office. Um, so this top uh, plot on the left-hand side here is showing um, basic the number of hours that we were detecting a face in front of the camera across the whole data set. Um, the number of people in this uh, corpus is about uh, 120. So you can see that most people are arriving in the office around 8 a.m. They're leaving around 5 to 6 p.m. So you can see the largest density of time that they're in front of their machine in the office is during that period. And you can clearly see you know, people take a break at lunch, uh, so there's less data in that period, kind of between um, 11.30 and, and 1.30. And then if we look at volume of email, it's a similar type of distribution. So people are mostly sending emails in work hours, um, and they are sending a majority of the emails earlier in the day, um, and then uh, less, uh, the density is slightly lower in the afternoon. So if we look at positive affects, this is measured by the facial expressions that we're coding. Um, so we're using the camera feed, detecting the face, and extracting um, information about the positivity or negativity of the expressions. Uh, we can see as a kind of a two-peak distribution here, um, people are, you know, high, highest positive affect tends to be kind of in the morning, it decreases, um, and then starts to increase again. Um, and, and this is sort of second peak in the afternoon. Uh, this is quite a consistent trend. It's actually not um, necessarily an original finding. There are, there are papers that look at Twitter data and look at the sentiment of tweets across um, the day and have found similar types of patterns that people are tweeting the most positive content <coughs> at the beginning of the day and that tends to decrease and they're starting to tweet more negative content or less positive content towards, um, uh, towards uh, the middle of the day, and it picks up a little in the afternoon when people have sugar and more energy, and then that decreases again. Uh, with negative affect, there's a more sort of uh, uh, a, a more sort of gradual increase in that signal across the day. So, at the beginning of the day, people are expressing more positive, less relatively less negative affect, um, and that ratio decreases across the day as as people possibly get more tired um, and more lethargic, more likely to express negative emotion. 
Um, the interpretations of these data I'm giving you are, are hypotheses. We don't know for sure why they're behaving this way, I, I, but I want to sort of give you an idea of the, the types of hypotheses we might have around the, why we see these patterns of behavior. Um, and we actually see quite similar patterns in the email sentiment. So when we analyze the sentiment of the messages people are sending, um, it's a little more noisy because people, uh, emails are very discreet observations, right? People send a certain amount of emails throughout the day, whereas facial coding, we have continuous observation when they're in front of the camera. Um, but m most positive affect is in the, in the beginning of the day for email and at the end of the day, uh, for, for uh, negative affect is highest at the end of the day. Um, and if we actually plot these on top of each other, it becomes quite clear, um, you know, kind of how correlated they are. I plotted them once here at the raw data, and then I just applied a, a small offset because with a cross correlation, there was a, a slightly more optimal correlation with a time difference. Um, to just kind of illustrate the correlation of these um, two signals from the different modalities. Uh, and so that's, that's interesting to me because, again, it's sort of a validation. We are, it does seem to be that we're measuring something about people's emotional state via these channels. Um, and these patterns are consistent with prior work as well. So it gives us more confidence that, in, indeed, we're able to track emotions um, with some, some accuracy using this type of passive uh, monitoring. Uh, one thing we've done recently is look um, at how people's emotion regulation ability seems to affect these patterns. Uh, emotion regulation strategies help us uh, modulate how we experience and express emotion. Um, we had people fill out a survey uh, to describe what strategies they use. So there are different types of strategies you can use. One, um, one of these strategies is, is cognitive reappraisal. So when you ex experience the stimulus, you can appraise, uh, you know, how, like how you, you can think about how you might respond or um, uh, react to that. And that can influence the actual emotion you experience. That's the, uh, the theory. Uh, and then there's also, um, Another strategy, which is emotion suppression. So if you, if you feel an emotion, you can just choose to suppress that or to express it to people around you. In this case, we're looking at reappraisal ability. Um, and it seems if we look at negative affect, where in the previous slide we saw that kind of gradual increase in negative affect across the course of the day, people with low, um, lower reappraisal um, skills or, or who employ reappraisal strategies less seem to have a sort of steeper increase in negative affect than people who have better uh, reappraisal or, or employ cognitive reappraisal more. Um, so it suggests that indeed there are sort of actions we can take um, that might impact um, our mood. Uh, and these are often things that we're not necessarily consciously thinking about, right? I don't think about how often I use cognitive reappraisal as a strategy and how that might affect how I'm perceived by other people or what types of emotions I express. Um, but it does seem to suggest that one way to like, limit the amount of negative affect that I express is to think about ways I could use reappraisal as a strategy. Um, it's just one idea. Uh, we've applied this um, in, a, in a context, actually, you know, in prior work, we, we collected somewhat similar types of data, but created um, visualizations for people so they could see that data over time. And then also see the context that those emotions went along with. So they could hover over the predictions of their emotional state and see the people that they emailed and the documents they accessed. Um, so we're, we're trying to think about, you know, how do we take this, these observations, this rich, passive, um, passively collected data of people's emotions and help people with it. How do, how do they, how are they able to ingest it? Um, in the same way, you know, analogously you might have to a fitness tracker, right? You see your steps every day, you see them across the course of the day, uh, and that might in, um, be one way of helping influence uh, behavior change or, or, or things like that. Um, and we're trying to think about, yeah, how, how might that um, work in, in the context of emotion. Uh, 
and I think there are there are lots of um, applications of this. Uh, one is in in the workplace. Um, I, you know, I think there's a lot of positive applications of this to help you know people be more productive, be happier, um, be less stressed. Um, there are also some negative applications too, um, and so we tried to kind of summarize some of those um, different uh, points of view in this this article. Um, and I'd be interested to, to talk with uh, talk with people afterwards to see you know what you think are the the, the pros and cons of this type of tracking. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that I would um, first talk about facial expressions and then talk about um, physiological measurements. Uh, part of my work has been uh, trying to find ways to leverage uh, the sim similar data that we're using to code facial behavior to extract physiological information. Um, so from a video uh, of people, just regular RGB video, um, we could use signal processing tools to actually extract uh, information about the pulse and uh, the respiration uh, rate of, of the subjects. Uh, this is um, definitely a more, um, uh, uh, definitely a newer technology than facial coding, so it's less um, mature. Uh, there's still a lot of um, questions about how we make it robust enough to measure um, this information <coughs> accurately in, in you know, in, in the wild, in situ, uh, but it offers an interesting avenue to explore. Um, some other work we did was using similar types of techniques to analyze um, accelerometer data and gyroscope data to recover um, pulse information, essentially heart rate, um, uh, using the subtle motions of the body. Uh, both of these uh, signals <coughs> carry information about um, people's stress because as your, um, your uh, autonomic nervous system regulates your organs, it changes the way or the, the, the patterns of your heartbeats. And those are things we're interested in extracting because often facial expressions don't give us a good measure of someone's arousal or um, they, they can give us information about valence, how positive or negative someone might be feeling, um, but not necessarily the, the activation or the level of arousal of that uh, response. Uh, so one experiment we did was to um, see if we could just distinguish between uh, people who were um, in low arousal state and a high arousal state using this non-contact imaging uh, measurement. So what you see on the left-hand side here is people who are just resting. They're sitting in front of the camera. And then on the right-hand side, they're doing mental arithmetic. So they've been given a task to solve math problems um, in their head. And uh, using the cameras, we, we uh, camera signal, we analyzed um, the video and extracted the pulse and respiration information um, and heart rate variability uh, measures. And indeed, the camera signal is, is sensitive enough to pick up those changes in physiological states. So when people were um, doing the mental arithmetic, they were, they were breathing faster uh, than when they were in the resting state. And they also had a higher um, uh, uh, low frequency heart rate variability signal. So they were, their body was responding to the cognitive um, load that they were experiencing uh, from the, the task. And we were able to pick that up with the camera. Uh, more recently, we've been trying to um, figure out ways to do this kind of spatially. Um, so the blood flow on the, on the face is not um, uh, not evenly distributed, as you imagine, um, there, there are in parts of the face with higher blood perfusion. Uh, and there's also obstructions, like there's hair in certain parts of the face, um, and there's, there's shadows and things like that. Um, so what these videos are showing is, is a, a heat map of the distribution of that pulse signal um, extracted from the video. And you can see, uh, particularly the forehead and the cheeks um, have higher blood perfusion, so they tend to be good areas to analyze if you want to, to extract the heart rate. Um, this, this video just shows some results um, on some, uh, some benchmark data sets. Uh, so what you see in red there is the, the contact sensor measurements, so using the traditional fingertip sensor to capture the pulse. And then on the right-hand side, you see the algorithm's uh, prediction of, of the pulse signal. And 
you can see that they align um, fairly accurately. Let me just go back to the beginning of that video so you can see the pulse information again. Um, the second part of the video shows the, the respiration prediction. Uh, so you can see that the heart beats um, here pretty, pretty well aligned with the heartbeats uh, there. E even when people are moving, um, which is something that often causes challenges. Uh, so in this video, you'll see the uh, respiration information. Uh, and this is mostly looking at motion of the body. So it's, uh, it's essentially kind of optical flow, if you will. Um, and we're able to um, extract that uh, as well. I have a GitHub page with some of the implementations of different algorithms for doing this, if you're interested in, in trying any of them out. Uh, <clears throat> after we published our initial work on, on uh, imaging uh, PPG, um, uh, Bill Freeman's group at MIT did some really interesting work magnifying that signal in videos. You might have seen some of these. They were pretty popular in the press. Um, so what you see here is an original video on the left and then a couple of magnified videos um, in the middle and on the right. Uh, and if you look closely, particularly at the forehead, you can see um, the color changing. And that's, they're just, what they're doing here is magnifying um, that change that we're measuring to capture the pulse signal. Um, here's another example uh, from the data set I showed you. It might be a little hard to see with the lighting here. But you can, if you can, if you look at the forehead or the cheeks, you can kind of see um, that color change magnified. Uh, what's really interesting with this algorithm is we're magnifying the color change. We're not magnifying any of the other motions or um, behaviors in the video, uh, which is something we're trying to, because we want we want to just magnify the physiological change and not um, other you know, pieces of information. <coughs> Uh, and in this video, you'll sh see the uh, magnification of the respiration information. Um, so particularly look at the, the shoulders here. Um, the, the magnification's a little more blurry in that case um, because it's at a similar frequency um, to, to the head motion. And so the algorithm is, is a little more difficult to, uh, to uh, separately kind of magnify just, just the respiration and not the, um, the other motions that are in the video. Uh, what's interesting about these approaches um, is that they can be done at quite long ranges, which might be um, unexpected. Uh, you do have to use a sort of higher end camera and nice lens, um, but some of my collaborators uh, in, in uh, the Air Force labs have shown that you can still measure someone's pulse up to 50 meters in distance with some reasonable level of accuracy. Um, and it does raise you know, big questions about you know, what, is, um, what, what should we do with this technology, right? It's, it's clearly measuring things that people are not used to um, controlling or suppressing or um, expressing. Um, like we're used to doing that with facial expressions. We can hide our emotions on our face if we want to. But our physiological changes, if I react to some stimulus, the physiological response is very hard for me to control. Um, and if someone can measure that without contact with me, that's, um, that's uh, you know, a little scary in some, in some, in some sense. Uh, we, we built a, an augmented reality version of this where you kind of saw an overlay of that pulsing information. So by wearing the HoloLens, the camera, would be, the camera that's on the HoloLens would be analyzing the face of the person you're talking to um, and then extracting the pulse information. Then you'd see a mask overlaid on their face, which was pulsing to magnify uh, essentially the, the change in the, the blood flow. Uh, again, you know, most people still don't know that this can be, do can be done in many cases. Um, and so there's a so a big ethical question about, you know, how you're, you're measuring things that people might not even be aware that can be measured uh, without contact with them. Um, one nice thing we can do that um, uh, Vincent Chen at, the, at MIT did was to show how we can actually apply these sort of in reverse and remove physiological information from videos. 
Um, so in, in this case, what we're doing is filtering out, uh, or what, what he was doing was filtering out the, the changes related to the physiological um, uh, signal so that uh, the video was unaltered in other regards, but you could no longer see the physiological state of the individual. Um, and that's interesting. Um, you might see that you know, people who are being inter interviewed on TV start to demand that their physiological information is removed from the video before it's broadcast. Um, but it, it does, you know, there is some um, work to look at how we could potentially kind of maintain privacy of some of this information um, in video. Uh, so the next, the next part of the talk, I really want to focus on, on kind of synthesis. So I've talked a lot about sensing of these signals, um, but in order to build systems that, that help people, that um, are expressive and interactive, uh, we need to be able to synthesize um, uh, responses to them. And we can do that in a literal fashion by building agents that actually you know, emote things. Um, there was a, a Super Bowl commercial this year with a, a little robot, I think it was for H&R Block or some tax. Um, they were trying to build an emotional robot. It wasn't quite working. Um, so it, it laughed when it was sad, but um, you know, there's some definitely uh, some applications of emotionally expressive avatars. Um, so we've done some work looking at generating dialogue uh, for bot, uh, bots and dialogue systems that is more emotionally expressive. Uh, and to do this, we leverage contextual information from uh, images that are associated with that dialogue. So we analyze. Um, videos that go along with um, the dialogue, extract things like facial expression information and, and sentiment of the scene, and then try to use that to generate a response that's more emotionally appropriate. Uh, this is trained on uh, social media data, so places where people have tweeted an image and a caption, and then there's been a dialogue that's gone alongside that, that, uh, that tweet. Um, and so it's Definitely noisy data. It's definitely not uh, exactly what we see in in every aspect of life, but it is one uh, one source that we have kind of large scale data from. Um, so we have the traditional um, a text uh, a based approach where we input some text and we want to generate a response to that text, um, and then in uh, in our proposed model we. We analyze the image as well to extract these features and then use that to generate uh, the response. And this works quite well. It's um, in the sense of pushing the dialogue towards the emotion that is reflected in the image. Um, so if we, if we give um, the algorithm an input piece of dialogue and a picture of someone smiling, the, output the sentiment of the output dialogue is more likely to be positive, but whereas if the person looked like they were in pain or was you know, grimacing, then the output dialogue would more likely be negative. Um, so it's, the model is able to learn some simple relationships between these facial expressions and, and how positive or negative the text might be to, to be sort of appropriate to the situation. Clearly it's not that's not always applicable, right? Someone could be in, you could snap a picture of someone who's in a hospital bed, you know, just start you know, feeling uncomfortable. You don't want the bot to say something negative, right? Like you might want to say something encouraging and positive. Um, so there's still a long way to go to make, uh, to, to have this system understand kind of the norms of how people interact. Um, but. It's encouraging it was able to learn some relationships between the image content and the text. Another thing we've been looking at is, is uh, speech synthesis. Uh, so if you've interacted with um, uh, a bot uh, through a voice-based interaction, you might have noticed that in some cases they're quite inexpressive. It's quite a neutral tone. Um, we want to be able to synthesize speech from text in a way that is more expressive. So you'll hear three. Uh, samples here, one that's neutral, one that's sad, and one that's angry. Dude, you never texted me. Dude, you never texted me. Dude, you never texted me. Um, so you can see, you can notice the difference. It's still not perfect. Like, you probably can still guess that that's a machine. Um, but 
it's clearly more expressive um, than uh, than systems we've had in the past, which typically hold a kind of neutral tone. I'll show sure. another example. This is why I want you gone ninety percent of the time. This is why I want you gone ninety percent of the time. This is why I want you gone ninety percent of the time. Uh, so. We're, we're trying to make it more expressive, um, and ultimately we want to do that um, through the dialogue, as I mentioned, through the, the speech synthesis, and also through um, avatars and, and visual uh, modalities. So we're, we're working on um, some embodied characters that can leverage these algorithms to have a conversation with you, so you can sit down and kind of talk. Um, the nice thing about dialogue models is that they're getting you know, incrementally closer to being able to have more extended dialogue, so you can actually sit down and you know converse for a few minutes without um, reaching too many sort of dead ends. I'll show you one example. It's a you know it's a bit cherry picked, but just to give you an idea of kind of the interactions. Would you like to see a movie after? How about an action movie? I'm open to anything. Okay. I'd rather watch an action movie, a romance movie, or a thriller. What's your favorite movie? I really like the Marvel movies. I really like the Marvel movies. Which movie do you like? I think my favorite is Iron Man. I've never seen Iron Man 2. Oh, well, maybe we should watch that on DVD. Sounds like a good idea to me. Great, should we do that on Friday night? That would be great. Awesome, okay, I'll see you then. Uh, so that, that dialogue was all generated uh, through a neural network um, that's you know, here, the, the speech is being recognized from what I say, and then we're generating responses to that um, in an end-to-end -end fashion. Uh, clearly, that agent has never seen any movies. It doesn't know what Iron Man is. It doesn't you know, know what Marvel is. It's just learned a dialogue model from observing many, many interactions. Um, so there's still a lot of statefulness and other types of consistency we need to build into that system to make it you know, effective and have, be able to have much more grounded, real conversations that are meaningful. Um, but uh, in, if we want to test some of these systems that are emotionally expressive, the first challenge is just to be able to have a dialogue with someone so that we can engage them long enough to be able to express emotion and see how they react to it. Uh, and so that's what, that's the kind of first stage we're trying to get to. Uh, so we've been running experiments with people interacting with this agent. Um, the one you saw there was just a voice based, uh, but that we have an embodied version. And it seems that people um, tend to like agents that speak like them. That's kind of to be expected that um, we had the agent try to adapt to the speaking style of the participant. Um, so it would observe their pitch and their loudness and their rate of speaking and try to mimic um, some of that behavior. It's very subtle, um, it's not a, a huge effect, uh, but it does seem to suggest that um, this thing that humans do, linguistic style matching, can be um, you know, reflected in an agent, and people tend to like that. Uh, different types of people with different personalities put different weight on visual expression <coughs> and, and verbal expression. Um, so it's really interesting. High, higher consideration people who are, uh, speak at a slower pace, typically, and um, tend to leave more gaps in between statements, tend to focus more on the linguistic aspects um, uh, versus the, the uh, expression, the embodied expression, whereas people who are more um, involved and more emotive and uh, 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 tend to speak faster, tend to put more weight on facial expressions based on our, um, our studies, which is an interesting finding. Again, these are quite subtle uh, things. Um, but we're, we're continuing to do these types of uh, experiments. Um, the last thing I want to touch on before I finish is, uh, I kind of talked about sensing and, and synthesis of emotions, um, but what does it actually mean for a machine to, in a sense, have an emotional response? Um, 
And one thing I, I was exploring with Ashish Kapoor at MSR was this idea that um, you know, I, I, as humans, we're kind of we're born with some innate response to, to dangerous things. Um, if you put a, ba a baby will avoid um, going close to a, at the edge of a table if it's put on a table. Um, uh, it seems at a very young age. Uh, so there's some response of that baby to that situation that's dangerous to them. Um, and uh, there, there are you know, potentially evolutionary arguments for this that we kind of, our, our brain is hardwired to respond to certain things. And there's also a lot of things that we learn very quickly at a young age that help protect us. Um, and so we were playing with this idea of what would happen if we gave you know, what, what would happen if an autonomous vehicle had some of these visceral reactions to situations that were dangerous? Um, so what we did was to, um, we took a, a simulated uh, environment called AirSim, which allows us to uh, uh, train autonomous um, uh, vehicles in, in a simulated safe environment. And uh, we gave the agent um, physio uh, a model of human physiological responses to danger. Uh, so traveling fast, traveling um, you know, close to objects, turning very fast, uh, tilting the car, um, all uh, caused human subjects to become aroused uh, uh, by, you know, by that potentially dangerous situation. Uh, so we, we used an RL, like a typical RL um, framework, and we introduced that that intrinsic physiological reward. So the, ag the agent, the car, no longer needed to crash in order to receive some negative feedback. Only if it went too fast or um, drove too close to an obstacle, it would get some negative, essentially negative penalty from that. Um, and what we saw from this is just, it's a very um, sort of simple experiment to start with just to see how much this physiological uh, reward impacts performance. Um, what you see here on these graphs is that uh, when lambda is non-zero, uh, is, there is some weight given to the intrinsic reward um, and some weight given to the extrinsic reward, which is crashing or hitting obstacles and things like that. Uh, and so the, the agent is, to learn, is able to learn to be able to, to, to drive more quickly, essentially, and with less um, uh, with less crashes, when it has some contribution of this physiological reward, in addition to rewards from the environment, the extrinsic rewards, um, and this is you know potentially explained because uh, it's able to, each of its episodes of learning before it ends up crashing, it's able to get further because it's receiving this kind of uh, uh, feedback about you know, how dangerous each situation is, is in is. Um, and so we're, we're quite encouraged by this result and are thinking about ways to you know, embed such kind of, this sort of visceral response to situations into autonomous systems. What does that mean? Is that really giving the machine emotion? I don't think so, but it's perhaps a little closer um, to that end goal. Um, and then very finally, um, and many of the things I've talked on about are kind of definitely um, raise big ethical questions, privacy questions. Um, I really like this quote from Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis, uh, who were looking at technology in the early part of the last century and thinking about how cameras and photography invaded people's privacy. And they, you know, they, they said, you know, uh, with the invention of new technology, we need to establish new norms, essentially, for how people are protected, or we need to invent new ways of protecting people from that technology and the bad uses. Um, and I think we're at a stage where there's a lot of new uh, technology, um, and we don't necessarily have all of these new mechanisms for protection. I think that's a really interesting conversation to have. <coughs> Uh, one thing we've launched recently um, is uh, an initiative, an idea we're testing uh, to give people who release uh, source code the ability to um, prevent some certain use cases that they feel are unethical. Uh, so if you want to release some image classification algorithm 
um, source code on GitHub, but you don't want someone to come and take it and use it for um, uh, a surveillance system, uh, you can release it uh, in an otherwise open source fashion, but um, enable a, so a contractual agreement with the person who's using that code that they won't use it for um, a, set, a, a specified set of applications that you feel are not, it's not ready for, it's not, uh, that's not ethical. Um, we really want community feedback to this. Uh, we, it's just an, one idea of how we can potentially help um, uh, maintain you know, positive and responsible uses of, of machine learning algorithms in particular. Um, that brings me to the end of uh, my talk. I'd be happy to share more about any of those projects um, or discuss any um, ideas uh, that this kind of brings to mind. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. This is, this is fascinating. Um, I, have a, I have a question, but I'm going to preface it with a comment. Com <laughs> comment is a question. It could have been a question, but I'm not going to ask you a question. But it just strikes me, when you have examples of a female voice speaking angrily and sadly about, dude, you didn't text me, and this is why I want you to call 90% of the time, there's, it sort of demands an examination of the gender politics going on here with respect to affect. That's the comment, not the question. Here's the question. One of the things I think we all took away from the um, Facebook Emotional Contagion uh, study is the, the enormous value in an ad-supported environment that accrues to advertisers in being able to, for instance, only deliver their ads to happy people. Um, so you're, you're, you've spoken a little about some of the sort of ethics things. I, I want to sort of ask about that, particularly in the context of the monetization of affect and potentially the weaponization of affect. But it's like, how do you think this stuff plays where, uh, or what can we do about the ways in which um, uh, the, the context in which technologies of this sort get deployed are ones, uh, ones where there is enormous monetary value associated with you know, the monitoring of our bodies. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's a, it's a big question. Um, I think it's, and it's a very important one to have. Um, I, th I think it's, it's the natural challenge with almost with any technological development is there's good use cases and bad. In this case, more bad use cases may come to mind um, to some people than good ones. Uh, but I do believe there's a lot of positive applications, but how do, we, how do we stop them from being abused or used in ways that are not ethical? I think transparency is one of the mechanisms. So um, I think, you know, we're, in our work, we're always trying to be transparent about what's being measured. Um, in the, one of the challenges with that is people don't, uh, they enable stuff and, and they consent to stuff and then they forget about it or they don't turn it off or they don't realize the long-term consequences of that. And so that's our challenge as researchers is to think about what, what's the long-term consequences of that. Um, that's still, there's still a lot of research to do. Um, but yeah, I was having this discussion um, with someone earlier today. It's, um, I, I believe that ultimately we will invent these types of algorithms. Um, we can either try not to, or we can try to do it in a way that is responsible. Um, and I think the latter is the one that's gonna be most effective. Um, but I, I don't have a sort of black and white answer of how we stop that, right? Uh, there, there's a, a lot of nuances and complexity to that. Yeah. Right, I, yeah, I wouldn't expect it, but it, I mean, just to turn it into the more technical question then, I mean, there's questions, for instance, about where the model gets built, right? What things are happening locally, what things are happening remotely, what kinds of bodies of data get collected over time in order to build you know, models for individuals versus generic ones. So it's like, is that part of the transparency stuff here? I mean, then, because then there's a challenge about how you explain this in a way that makes sense to anybody when there's a series of technical decisions getting yes. made. Yes, yeah, yeah, and the explainability is another, yeah, it's, that's, you know, even if we, there's many layers to this. One is like the accuracy. Are we actually measuring what we say we're measuring? And there's, there's you know, a lot of controversy and emotion about that. Just, you know, so even 
before we get to use cases, like when you say to someone, oh, we measured this about you, and they disagree with that, that can happen a lot when you're measuring emotion. It doesn't happen as much with object recognition because it's obvious what the objects are in the scene, and that's pretty black and white, whereas with, with emotions, it's much more blurred. So that's one layer. There's another layer, even if it's perfect, you know, our recognition of emotion somehow, magically, it was perfect. Uh, there's questions about, um, as you say, kind of the, how that's used, where it's stored, who owns it. Um, I think we're seeing positive moves towards more regulation, but I, th I think we need way more regulation about data generally, whether it's emotion data or other data. We just need, you know, we need much, m GDPR is one way of doing it, um, and you know, if no one comes up with a better idea, I'd just like GDPR everywhere, like more of that. Um, we need mechanisms to, to do it. But it, as a scientist, it, it's a little hard to say, say that as well, because as I meant, like with the source code thing as well, like that applies to data too. We want to be able to share code. We want to be able to share data. We want people, but then once you share something, it's very hard to control who uses it and what they use it for. So um, yeah, we're thinking through those things. Um, <coughs> But I, I would love more of these discuss discussions at the conferences I go to, which are mostly computer science heavy and don't have an ethics track. And they should, I think they should. And that's something we've discussed um, with uh, some of the <coughs> folks at MSR who are working on, uh, like Kate Crawford and others who are working on this, this some of these ideas. Do you have a sense as to what are the constraints your uh, physiological measurements, like heart rate, and uh, breathing, like within what setting that's going to work well, and how well it works at the individual level. And I'm thinking, like, how how close is that to something where you could use at an individual, like say, patient level, versus collecting collecting information on a population where there is a much larger margin for error at the individual level? Like, what are what are yeah. the constraints of your tests at? Uh, so the most effective place I've seen it employed is in. Uh, baby monitoring ICUs. So you have a sort of captive subject there, they're in a box, uh, the lighting's nice and you know controlled, and the camera's pointing down and there's skin exposed because maybe they're wearing like a diaper, but there's, you know, it, it's very good for that because contact sensors are uncomfortable for the baby, they move around, that causes artifacts. And actually, in some cases, if the algorithm's designed well, that can be less sensitive to some of those motion artifacts and the actual contact sensors yeah. themselves. Um, but if I was to put this in this room and put a camera up here, I wouldn't be able to reliably measure yeah. the, the heart rate of many people in this room. Um, so it's, you still need good quality image sensors, you still need to be relatively close to the subject, you still need the ambient lighting to be bright enough that you're, um, and that there's not, an, not too much specular reflection and other things that are causing interference. So just a but random like selfie uh, probably would have in a in a random environment would probably have a lot of reflection. Yeah, yeah, and and so if you were to do this on YouTube, right, just put a random YouTube video. That YouTube video has been heavily compressed, mm -hmm. and video compression also destroys this signal. So um, I've tried to run this on like presidential debates and other people <laughs> have tried to do it on celebrities. It doesn't generally work very well because oh. those broadcast media are compressed. So that's an um, adversarial attack on this, just to compress it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. So that what Vincent was doing to filter out that signal is kind of what video compression does, because video compression assumes that these very subtle variations are not important for the quality of the video. And so it filters them out to save storage space. Um, yeah, so, so it is a yeah. Oh, yeah, way to I, because challenge. that's high frequency filtering usually. I would think things like respiration, it's, it's not looking at high frequency. Yeah, filtering. and they're very subtle pixel changes, yeah. which, uh -huh. you know, to your average observer, they wouldn't notice. Hi, um, I have two questions probably on the sensing side. One is, uh, what's the current state of the art for um, facial expressions? Because like facial expressions, smile, anger, like these humans can control, but like micro expressions, which just like physiolog physiological um, changes, these are really hard to control. So are 
Uh, do we have the capability right now to capture these micro expressions? Uh, that was the first question. The second question which I had in mind was, um, you mentioned that you had studied these expressions across broad dem demographics. So did you encounter or did the research suggest that uh, there were like certain demographics where um, certain expressions are more dominant than like they're more alien to some demographics and like certain new expressions were, because I've been like listening to NPR kind of these podcasts in which there has been studies which tell us that um, there are certain ex certain emotions which are totally new to all us, but they are quite remote in certain demographics of the world. Okay. So, yeah, good question. So the, with micro expressions, um, I'll be completely honest, I don't actually know the technical definition of a micro expression. Okay. Um, in terms of these algorithms are sometimes very good at picking up very subtle motions because that's the strength of machines, right? They can see on a yeah. pixel level subtle changes. Um, but having said that, also they're very sensitive to lighting and other things too. Um, so the results I showed were on a very large scale where hopefully the noise kind of disappears and our signal, although it's not perfect, is, is kind of above that noise level. Um, I'm, and I'm, what, to be really clear, what we're measuring is the muscle activity. Um, I, I was giving these emotional terms like positive affect, negative affect, because I really help. I really think that helps explain kind of what's going on, mm -hmm. on some level. But ultimately, it's very very hard to map these actions to an internal feeling. It's still there's still a lot of ambiguity there. Um, and so, because these are all data driven, right? I believe these are neural networks behind all these recognition things, or there are some other. Yeah, things. but they're recognizing what's happening on the face, and, and that's only one modality, right? Like, I, you know, I could smile at you, I could be in a lot of pain, but I smile at you because it's a polite thing to do, right? Like, there, there's a lot of messiness yeah. in this, and that's why. Uh, so far, we're only looking at very, very crude measures of positive affect and negative affect, and we're not trying to tell if people are lying or not, because I just don't think it really can be done very well. Um, the second question about whether some cultures do or don't express certain things, I'm sure there's variation. Uh, of course, there must be variation. I mean, there, these, there's a lot of social and, and cultural context that we use to communicate. So there must be variation, but again, we're not really, it would be a fascinating thing to research, but um, we're looking at such basic things just like the presence of smiling, because that's hard enough to detect in these very uncontrolled videos. Um, and we also, with the internet, unfortunately can't reach populations who are kind of really out of um, contact with other groups. So. It would be fascinating, and there are researchers who are doing sort of more ethnographic and, and basic psychology research in that domain. Um, but I'm I'm probably not the person to answer that question. Okay. With that, uh, I'd like to. Thank you. Thank you.